Happy Father's Day. I'm Jack Lovering, pastor at Converse St. Andrews United Church. And I'm Melody Lovering, the pastor at New Scotland United Church and Ridge Community Church. Because we are on video, we're gathered in many places. Wherever we now gather, generations gathered long before Europeans landed on these shores. The original inhabitants of this land, known to some indigenous peoples as Turtle Island, took seriously the Creator's call to be stewards of air, land, water, and creature. This morning, we give our thanks for their conservancy. We exist in this place because of the lessons they continue to teach. Let us come before the Creating One as we offer our prayers, hear holy story, and sing sacred songs. Our call. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. Both in the day of my trouble, I will call on you. For you will answer me. Let us pray. God of strength and courage, in Jesus Christ, you set us free from sin and death and call us to the risk of faith and service. Give us grace to follow him who gave himself for others, that by our service we may find the life he came to bring. Amen. Our reading today is from Matthew chapter 10 from the Message Version. A student doesn't get a better desk than her teacher. A laborer doesn't make more money than his boss. Be content, pleased even, when you, my students, my harvest hands, get the same treatment as I get. If they call me the master dung face, what can the workers expect? Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. What's the price of a sparrow? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million sparrows. Stand up for me against world opinion and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law, cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. This is the word of the Lord, and we give him thanks for it. Well, I read something intriguing about hairs, but the path must be a little off. The average person has 100,000 hairs on their head. We all lose about 50 hairs a day. By those figures, we would all be bald within six years. Fortunately, they grow back. The striking part of this passage is how Jesus moves from talking about God's care of sparrows and counting hairs 
to the claim that he has come to bring division and war. Quinn Caldwell pointed out how far removed this idea is from the church today. We long for peace. He writes about the heart of the matter. We live in a world where war is good business, where corporations and governments profit from the conflict between police and poor and from the resulting imprisonment of millions. Where the powerful know that as long as the weak are fighting each other, they're unlikely to turn on the ones holding the reins. Try to bring peace to any of these situations, and if their violence wasn't already directed at you, it will be soon. This is what Jesus meant, I think. Claim that every human life matters, and those who profit from the ending of lives are going to get mad at you. Demand that leaders see humans the way God sees humans, and leaders whose position depends on grinding others to dust are going to react. Show up as the Prince of Peace and the Lords of War are going to scramble their jets. It's not that Jesus likes violence. It's more that he knows that in a world built on it, you can't avoid it. It's not desirable, but it's inevitable. The only choice, really, is between living with the violence that already is and living with the violence that comes with trying to change it. Well, we're learning now that we can't say all lives matter until we first proclaim black lives matter. On a Sunday where we celebrate our First Nations, we remember that all lives matter means we also proclaim Aboriginal lives matter. Race is not the only divider. Jesus was plain that serving him could come at the cost of dividing families. Eugene Peterson in Like Do Your Youth wrote how division extends into the family. A search of scripture turns up one rather surprising truth. There are no exemplary families. Not a singly, single family member is portrayed in scripture in such a way so as to evoke admiration in us. There are many family stories. There is considerable reference to family life, and there is sound counsel to guide the growth of families, but not a single model family for anyone to look up to in either awe or envy. Adam and Eve are no sooner out of the garden than their children get into a fight. Shem, Ham, and Jepheth are forced to devise a strategy to hide their father's drunken shame. Jacob and Esau are bitter rivals and sow seeds of discord that bear centuries of bitter harvest. Joseph and his brothers bring changes on the themes of sibling rivalry and parental bungling. Jesse's sons, brave and loyal in their service of their country, are capricious and cruel to their youngest brother. David is unfortunate in both wives and children. He is a man after God's own heart and Israel's greatest king, but he cannot manage his own household. Even in the family of Jesus, where we might expect something different, there is exposition of the same theme. The picture in Mark chapter 3 strikes us as typical rather than exceptional. Jesus is active, healing the sick, comforting the distressed, and fulfilling his calling as Messiah, while his mother and brothers are outside trying to get him to come home, quite sure that he is crazy. Jesus' family criticizes and does not appreciate. It misunderstands and does not comprehend. The biblical material consistently portrays the family not as a Norman Rockwell group beaming in gratitude around a Thanksgiving turkey, but as a series of broken relationships in need of redemption. It is because of this talk of division that we need to hear the comfort as the reading begins. God cares for us. That message comes through loud and clear in Matthew's Gospel. 
Jesus elevates the individual in God's eyes. First, he talks about the sparrows. To us, sparrows don't seem that important. To God, Jesus says, nothing is unimportant. God is with the sparrows when they fall. Little things matter to Almighty God. Even the hairs on your head are tallied and numbered. Of course, with many of us, it's a running tally. God's interest in our smallest detail is Jesus' way of describing to us the immeasurable love that God has for us all. We sometimes rush to the comfort of Scripture without looking at the cause. Jesus was warning about a time when those who followed him would face hard times. They needed to know about God's provision because they were going to feel the heat of division. That division came right down to the breaking apart of families. What the Christian church needs to guard against is to be the source of divisions. We are followers of one who sees the sparrow fall and counts the hairs of people's head. We want to develop that care when we deal with others. Peterson put it well. Parents are in a position to forgive when they remember two things. One, the child that I am rearing is God's child. God loved the child before I did. He will continue this love long after I am gone. Two, God's method of dealing with sin, even the most destructive kind, is forgiveness. I'm not going to be able to improve on God's methods. What are you living for? Can you make the decision to live for Christ? I know for myself that decision sometimes has to be broken down into little pieces. We can answer glibly, I have decided to follow Jesus without counting the cost. If I'm trying to change behavior and become more Christ-like, sometimes I can't even authentically promise a week. We're experimenting with a lifestyle change. For the month of June, we're cutting back on calories. And with baby steps, we're focusing on two days a week. It's easier to give up food on a particular day, knowing that the rest of the week won't be famine. Well, that principle can work with character flaws as well. The work really belongs to God. In his series, The Edge of Adventure, uh, Bruce Larson wrote with Keith Miller. Larson talked about God's role. This is what he writes. God's love does not depend on any virtue in us or on our accomplishments. But as I understand it, the nature of his love is such that he does not leave us as he finds us. When someone begins the adventure of faith, God says to him, in effect, I am going to begin to change you. Programmed into your inner computer, through glands and genes and circumstances and experiences, is an inability to love totally. I love you so much that I want to change all those intricate wires of experience, sense and thought that make you an unknowable, unrelatable person. It may take a thousand years of reprogramming to make you a lover of people, of me and of yourself, but I promise that I will continue relentlessly until you have been totally transformed. I'll begin at the moment you give me your life, and I will not stop until you are a transparent, relate, relatable person. A loving God, who loves us the way we are and wants the very best for our lives, that is good news. That's something worth living for. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we want to remember this day the role that fathers play in shaping our families. We give thanks for the many loving examples of servant leadership within our families from years past until this present day. Where there have been failings, we know that fathers and those who have been raised by them can turn to you for the model of unconditional love. We are thankful for the guidance of loving dads throughout the years. On this Indigenous Day of Prayer, we acknowledge the great injustices perpetrated against those who lived on 
and cared for this land long before our ancestors arrived. We pray that with compassion and determination, we will continue to make ourselves aware of the impact of residential schools, the 60s scoop, and the suppression of indigenous culture and tradition, so that the legacy of colonization is acknowledged by each of us. Creator God, Great Spirit, you call us to relationships rooted in equality and respect. This day we covenant to be more aware of the racism that Indigenous, Métis, and Inuit people of this country experience. We commit ourselves to raise our voices when we hear prejudiced comments, to guide others in the sacred direction of celebrating diversity that is your gift to humanity. Creator God, Great Spirit, in the quiet of our hearts and through the witness of our beings, we pray thanks for your accompaniment on the journey toward individual and communal wisdom and understanding. That we who are the Church stand in solidarity and true to Jesus' call to reconcile with sisters and brothers. Creator God, Great Spirit, hear our prayers and guide our actions from this moment on. We pray using Jesus' words. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We go from here, a reconciled and reconciling people, with assurance that God, our Creator, the Great Spirit, cares for us deeply and accompanies us this day and every day. We go in the peace of Christ. Amen. Amen.